And there are some paradoxes, really. This is a, a tree of life, as you'd find in any textbook. And you can see it's, it's immediately unexpected, if you're not familiar with this kind of thing, that there are three big groups here. There's the bacteria, uh, and you can see what they look like. We're familiar with things like E. coli and so on. Then there's this other group. They look a lot like bacteria. They're called archaea. They're also prokaryotes. They look very similar. Uh, they're almost indistinguishable, in fact, in terms of electron microscopy. But in their biochemistry and their genetics, they're really rather different. And then you have the group that we belong to, the eukaryotes. Uh, and you can see immediately looking at this that all complex life as we know it, all multicellular organisms, all animals, all plants, fungi, algae, and so on, they are in just that tiny little group. If I use the cursor here, this tiny little group here. Um, so the question is, well, what happened down this part of the tree of life? Why is it that after four billion years of evolution in practically infinite populations, you get just these tiny cells, bacteria, archaea, and really nothing much more morphologically compli complicated than that? In terms of their biochemistry, in terms of the genetics, they're ingenious. But in terms of their morphology, they appear to be really quite stunted. So what was happening? That, I should say, is true at the cellular level. It's not just true at the level of elephants and so on. It's true, this is a, this is a fairly bog standard single-celled alga, Euglena, uh, and this is roughly to scale. This is one of the more complex prokaryotes, uh, bacteria that you find around these planktomycetes. This is roughly to scale. Uh, now, these planktomycetes have a number of properties which have been said to be relatively complex for, for bacteria, but you can see there is just no comparison really at all there. So eukaryotes, even at the level of single cells, are enormously more complex than, uh, than, than bacteria. Now there's a paradox here, and it's this that really interests me. So all complex life, as I've said, is based on this particular complex cell type. Cells with all kinds of things inside, as I've just shown you. They're called eukaryotic cells, but don't be scared of names. Um, they're full of membranes, they're full of dynamic cytoskeletons. They've got all kinds of things going on. They've got the nucleus. Eukaryotic, in fact, means true nucleus, and that's uh, their defining feature. They share all kinds of complex traits. So basically, all eukaryotes are sexual, or at least if they are not sexual, then they've lost it later on. That last common ancestor appears to have been a sexual cell. Um, they have a nucleus. They all have mitochondria, and I'll come more on that later. Uh, various properties like phagocytosis, the ability to go around and physically engulf other cells, essentially eating them. They also are not found, none of these traits are found in bacteria at all but they're found essentially in all eukaryotes. So prokaryotes, bacteria and archaea, these two groups, have none of these traits. They show essentially no tendency to evolve any of them. They just remain morphologically simple. Why not? If natural selection is about traits evolving step by step, small steps, each one offers some kind of an advantage, and the nucleus offers an advantage, you would predict that things like the nucleus or sex would just keep on evolving in bacteria, would evolve perhaps scores of times. That's actually exactly what we see with the eye. So from some kind of simple light-sensitive spot in early animals, um, the eye, morphologically different kinds of eye, as you can see here, have evolved essentially independently, admittedly from this common starting point, but it's from, from that starting point, independently on 60 or 70 different occasions. That's actually what natural selection predicts that each step offers a small advantage, it's selected for different environments, different sets of circumstances mean that you have different morphologies. Um, that's what you predict. That's not what we see, though, with complex life. So what was different? Well, the answer that you're most likely to hear from people is that there was some kind of an environmental bottleneck. So the, the most famous one is when oxygen levels first rose in the atmosphere, which was around about 2.2 billion years ago, 2,200 million years ago. Um, and you see all kinds of things in the rocks, these, uh, these banded iron formations, stunningly beautiful to look at. That's actually not particularly diagnostic, but it does show an increase in oxygen levels. Um, so perhaps there was some kind of a bottleneck that as soon as oxygen levels rose, then eukaryotic cells were possible. Other people, uh, Simon Conway Morris, for example, has talked about as the oceans cooled down over time, then perhaps that was a bottleneck eukaryotes, for the most part, can't deal with high temperatures, so perhaps they arose as soon as they could, as soon as the ocean temperatures cooled down enough. Perhaps there was something like a snowball earth, 
The date is wrong of this snowball Earth, 700 million years ago, but there was an earlier one around about 2.2 billion years ago, the same kind of time as the Great Oxidation Event. There are possible bottlenecks through which eukaryotes could have arisen. And if you look at the eukaryotic tree, again, this is a different way of depicting it, there's these five large groups here. This is a much more modern tree than the one I just showed you. These five super um, kingdoms, if you like. Um, so the fungi, the fungi and the algae, the, met, uh, sorry, the fungi are here, the metazoa, which is basically all animals are here. But a lot of these, a lot of these organisms are fairly unfamiliar to most people. But what I want, really want to bring out on this is that these sticks here give an indication of the genetic distance between them. And it's a very, very short distance. There's far more variation within these groups than there is between the common ancestor of each group. That looks a lot like some kind of an explosive radiation. It looks like a bottleneck. As soon as you had that cell there, the ancestor, the last common ancestor of all eukaryotes, it diverged. There was a, there was a, there was a great radiation. So it does look like a bottleneck. But there's different kinds of bottlenecks that you could have. It could be the environmental kind of bottleneck that I've been talking about, change in oxygen levels, change in temperatures. Um, or it could be biological. It may be that there's something to do with the structure of bacteria or archaea and so on, which prevented them from doing it. And, and they got through that bottleneck as soon as something changed about the structure. So not necessarily genetic, but perhaps architectural. Well, that does seem to be the answer. And the key to all of this <coughs> came with the discovery, or at least not so much the discovery, so much as uh, this large group was pointed out by Tom Cavalier-Smith, who's uh, now at Oxford, uh, in the early 1980s. He called attention to this group that he called the Archizoa. And they are all morphologically quite simple cells. They're a kind of a, a living fossil, if you like, between the, the prokaryotes, the bacteria and so on, and the more complex eukaryotes. And he argued that none of these have mitochondria. Now, I'll talk more about mitochondria in a few minutes, but mitochondria are basically the power plants that give uh, eukaryotes their energy. He argued that this is a kind of a halfway house before the earliest eukaryotic cells had acquired mitochondria at all, and therefore they should give us some insight into how complex life actually arose. Well, they did. They certainly did, but not as Cavalier-Smith anticipated at all. It turns out, having spent 20 years now studying these in a lot of detail, both in their, uh, in their structures and also in their genetics, that all of them had mitochondria in the past, and they lost them. They became uh, converted by reductive evolution, by specialization, into other organelles. So in the case of uh, Giardia, for example, which, uh, which is a parasite that causes all kinds of stomach uh, upsets and so on, they've got these little organelles called mitosomes that are almost certainly derived from mitochondria. Trichomonas has hydrogenosomes and so on. Again, they, they uh, appear to be, be tiny organelles that have derived from mitochondria. So there's several conclusions that we can draw from this. The first one is that they are genuine ecological intermediates. They really are there. There's about a thousand species of these things. It doesn't matter whether or not they're evolutionary intermediates. They haven't been outcompeted to extinction, which is exactly what you'd predict if the, environment, if the bottleneck was environmental. So they're still there. It's not as if there's some change in the environmental circumstances that allow eukaryotes to flourish and then the sophisticated ones that already exist outcompete everything else which is less sophisticated. These things are less sophisticated, but they're there. There's a thousand species or more of them, and they're doing perfectly well. Um, every one of these thousand species of archizoa arose from more complex ancestors. They evolved by reductive evolution. A lot of them are parasites, and, and they've specialized to a particular niche. But that doesn't account for all of them. But it's an interesting thing that all of them had an, an ancestor that was a lot more complex than any known bacterium. In fact, it was basically from that same last eukaryotic common ancestor that was already a complex cell. Uh, and then the third point from this is that because all of them turn out to have had mitochondria and then lost them, that last eukaryotic common ancestor must have had mitochondria. And that begs the question, was the acquisition of mitochondria um, and the origin of the eukaryotic cell, one and the same event.